Welcome to DevOps and Docker Talk, and I'm your host, Brett Fisher. I'm a Docker captain, a cloud native ambassador, and I create this content, <laughs> YouTube, podcast, courses, and I hope you find it all useful. This week, I'm in the studio with my co-host, Nirmal Mehta, a principal specialist solution architect at AWS. And like usual, we have container guests on the show again, talking about container projects. Our friend Neil Creswell, the CEO of Portainer, is back. And we're not talking about Portainer this time. We're talking about a new project. And he brought on his product engineering lead, Stephen Kang, to talk about K2D. That stands for Kubernetes to Docker, which is a bit of a crazy idea. It's a partial Kubernetes API running on top of Docker Engine without needing a full Kubernetes control plane. If you work with very small devices, maybe industry sensors and the infrastructure we all now call the edge, then container hardware is often hard for you to make simple, reliable, and automated all at the same time. So this project uses less resources than a single node K3S and still allows you to use Kubernetes tools to deploy and manage your containers, which are in fact just running on a Docker engine with no full-fledged Kubernetes distribution going on there. We get into far more detail on the architecture, the Portainer team's motivations for this new open source project and what its limitations are. This is an edited version of the weekly YouTube live show that we do every Thursdays that you can join with us at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern at brett.live. So please enjoy this episode with Neil Creswell and Stephen Kang of Portainer. It's time. Woo. It's time for the show. Brett, who are, what do we got going on today? We're all talking about Kubernetes to Docker. And who better to bring in the conversation about how do I run I mean, how do you even describe this? How do I run Kubernetes tools on top of Docker without having Kubernetes installed? That's basically what we're going to get into today with our special guest. I feel like this is like the ultimate news panel where we've brought in everyone from all parts of the globe. Uh, we're spanning three continents right now. Yeah. So, okay. You've seen him on the show before, Neil Creswell, CEO of Portainer. Hello. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be back again. Yeah, it's been, a while. it's been a hot minute, maybe three whole weeks or so. But we have now a special guest below, Stephen Kang, and he is the product engineering lead at Portainer. So in case you've used Portainer before, this is the person that you need to thank because he's doing the hard work. And he's coming out of New Zealand. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Hello. Good to be here. The first question is, how did this even come to exist? Like, why? Okay, so the main reason was Portainer's been doing a lot of work at the edge, the uh, industrial edge. So we're getting more and more customer pickup and deployments of Portainer in uh, Industry 4 projects. And so we're getting a lot of exposure to Docker running on an open PLC type device and then uh, Industry 4 software solutions being shipped as containers. So you now have to think about, well, how do I get this container-based application up and running on now thousands of very, very small devices. How do, how do I do that? Um, and yeah. so, yeah, that, that's a real challenge. Now, ordinarily you'd say, okay, well, don't worry about it. There's a bunch of industry tooling you can use. Yeah, but all that industry tooling is for Kubernetes, not Docker. Now, obviously there's Portana, but you know, there are particular reasons why you might want to use some other Kubernetes native tooling. And so the question came, well, how could we use all of this very rich CNCF ecosystem of tooling? against devices that in no way, shape, nor form are capable of running any of the Kubernetes distros that are available today. And what I'm talking about here are ARM32 devices with 512 meg of RAM. If you're lucky, uh, a gig of RAM. Um, these are the devices that make up 90% of Far Edge deployments. And Far Edge could be a factory floor where they're running automation that controls robots or machines. It could be an oil and gas field where there are very, very small devices that are connected to sensors on oil rigs or on ships up wind turbines. There's a bunch of far edge systems where the devices that control them are just incredibly small and there's no way of running Kubernetes on them. So that's where this thing came from. It was it started out as a thought idea. Is it possible? And it kind right. of went from there. All right. Now we have the premise. I mean, the one of the first questions we had too was like, is it, you know, a lot of us, 
Docker is so small and K3D is so small that when we're thinking of our maybe home labs or like Raspberry Pis, we sort of think about, well, this all runs fine there. And we don't really maybe, unless you're a, a deep, deep engineering nerd and you start to analyze the actual MIM and CPU usage differences of maybe like a Docker or, and we got some Swarm fans in here, so we're going to get those Swarm questions. And like that differencing from K3D, and a lot of us know that story of K3D and how Darren Shepard sort of was frustrated with the lack of a Kubernetes that was, you know, a single binary that was very small and efficient, didn't have all the unnecessary drivers and extra features that you, most of us didn't actually need in small setups. So K3D, weirdly, was started just like K3. this. It was sort of a hobby project yeah. for an engineer on the side. And now it's almost, it's a household name in the Kubernetes world. Do you, when you look at this thing, is it, does the profile vastly different? Is it really much more efficient for these smaller devices? Well, when you've got 512 megabytes of memory to play with, right, every megabyte counts. Yeah. You, and a lot of the industry for software solutions, interestingly enough, are Java-based. And so memory really counts in that regards. And what we found was when we tried to run K3D, K3S, K0S, micro K8s, we tried to run these lightweight distros. They all, to even just idle a distro, so, so the base operating system and the distro, either Docker and K3D or Docker and these other, sorry, uh, Linux and these base right. micro distros, they still needed between 450 to 700 megabytes of RAM to idle before you even run anything, before you run your apps. And that's just too much. Yeah. And also the way that they handle the quorum, it's quite hard on disk IO and you end up burning out you know, flash memory cards oh, yeah. pretty quickly. And so if you're actually deploying and redeploying and you've got lots of quorum updates, you start to wear out your, your flash pretty quickly. And when you think about true industrial settings, remember this is not designed for home use, this is designed for industrial use. You don't want to be going out and replacing your flashcards on sensors on a gas pipeline or somewhere in the middle of nowhere. You know, every, yeah. other, every other month, you just can't do that. So you want something really, really reliable. And you know, K2D, on top of just Docker, it's 20, me 20 megabytes of memory. That's it. Wow. So that's it. 20 megabytes of memory. And when it is not doing anything, so remember, or well, I should say not remember, but um, it's a translator. It's not running Kubernetes. It's, tra it's, it's translating incoming API requests to Docker API instructions. When you're not, when it's not translating anything, the CPU is zero, doesn't do anything. So it's only when it's receiving an inbound API request, does it, it does a real-time translation to Docker and then it, and then it stops. So the CPU is nothing. There's no quorum because there's nothing to keep in, in, in a quorum state. So CPU yeah. is, is near zero. This guy is near zero and memory is 20 megabytes. So and this is, we're talking about for one node, right? Like this is just a single node solution. This isn't like a clustered solution for. Many, although we'll get into that, I guess we should clarify what a cluster is and what do we quantify, but you mentioned quorum. So it's not like this creates three control plane nodes. Like we think of when we think of Kubernetes or swarm, this is just talking to a single Docker engine. Yeah. So uh, I should go back and then go forwards. So that it depends how you think this is either an emulator or a translator, right? They, they, they depends on how, how you want to think about it from a Kubernetes perspective from a from someone using kubectl or any other commands to interface with k2d it is basically kubernetes right it's basically kubernetes from a docker perspective if you log into the hosts you can run docker commands and as far as you can see on the host it looks like docker right so it's doing real-time translations what it takes is a single standalone docker host and makes it emulate or look like a single node kubernetes cluster so it's not clustered. There's no swarm support yet. And yes, we've had people asking for swarm and maybe it'll come in the future. It wouldn't be that difficult to translate to swarm commands, to be fair. But right now it takes a single Docker host and makes it look like a single node Kubernetes cluster. Interesting. Right. So that's 10 that's less than 10% of like a typical memory usage of like a standard, like those, those other micro K8s and uh, K3S solutions. That's a significant reduction in the amount of uh, utilization of resources. And you kind of also mentioned that it sounds like it's more event driven, right? You were saying that if there's no, if it's not doing anything, it's zero CPU, if I understood Correct. that correctly. Is it, so is it event driven? Like, is it triggered by like an eight, like a Kubernetes API call and then it like spins up and 
response to that event? Can you kind of go into how you're getting that optimization or that performance out of that? Yes, yeah, Steve, Stephen can probably talk about the architecture because I'll, I'll 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 get lost real quick. But it, it definitely the, the, there's definitely a REST API that's listening and it's listening for the inbound Kubernetes instructions. It then goes through it. The, the, there's, there's a job engine that runs in the background. Um, and that that job engine takes in command request, translates it to Docker commands, and executes it against the Docker daemon on that machine. But but basically, when 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 it hasn't been triggered by an incoming API request, there's nothing to do. Stephen, feel free to expand on that if you if you so desire. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much it. And I'll be going through the architecture, so that'll yeah. answer most of your questions for sure. Yeah, let's do it. I I think we're ready for the like. The yeah, demo sure. time. We need a sound for demo time. I, I, maybe I said this before. <laughs> Normal and I, let's make a little mental note. We need like <laughs> demo time demo or some sort of... Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so something pizzazz. Something pizzazz. Show us what you've got, Steven. All right. Let me jump into the screen okay. there. All right. Cool. We can see it. All right. We got gotcha. you. We got gotcha. you. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So, yeah. So, before I dive into the demo, I wanted to quickly go through the key to the architecture. So, it gives you better understanding. So it comprises of three main components, API, controller, and the adapter. So the, I'll go with the API first. And you can think that API as the normal Kubernetes API server. It's really similar. So as a Kubernetes user, you'll be using a tool, something like kubectl, and then you'll be interacting with the Kubernetes cluster with the chip config file, normally with the context set. And say when you execute kubectl get namespaces, that's going to trigger the REST, REST API call to the API server, and then it'll do the job. k 2 d is pretty much following the same model, so that the user will be using a tool like kubectl with the kube config that's generated by k 2 d You will be interacting with our API, and that API will be handling pretty much the same Kubernetes REST API calls. But the only difference is that because we wanted to minimize the footprint, we only support a number of resources. We don't support all the available Kubernetes resources. So those supported resources and operations can be found in our doc. So stuff like namespace, you'll see the supported operations, create, list, delete, node, PV, pod, and so on. So you can check our docs for that. And that's what the API handles. So it's just a API server that's listening to your Kubernetes requests. So that, that's why they, when it's an idle, the memory usage is pretty much near zero because without the request, it's pretty much staying idle, doing nothing. So let's say if I request a namespace creation to the Cape to the API, then the API will then trigger a call to the controller. And what the controller does is it's going to come up with the sequence. So what I mean by sequence is that you can definitely create just a single resource, just like namespace, but then Kubernetes can be comprised of, you know, like namespace, deployment, and service. So when you want to deploy a deployment, you have to make sure the namespace has to exist. So because this is not a real Kubernetes, we are doing the emulation. What controller does is that it's going to come up with priorities that, okay, the namespace will have to be created first and then the deployment and then the service. So the controller's job is to make sure that the requests are processed asynchronously, but in the right order. And let's say coming back to the namespace creation, then what it will do is that it'll talk to the adapter, which has two subcomponents, sub and one is the converter. And you can think this converter as the emulation, just like what Neil talked about, or translator. So behind the scenes, what it does is that it's going to accept the namespace object, which is the native Kubernetes object. Then it's going to translate it into the native Docker API compatible object. So it's going to deconvert, do the conversion, and then it's going to execute that Docker compatible API to the Docker engine using the socket. So that's what the converter does. And once the namespace is created and the client, the user will be 
running kubectl get namespaces just to check the namespace has been created. And that's when the API will then talk to the adapters directly. And this converter is actually bi-directional. So not only we translate the Kubernetes to Docker object, we actually do the vice versa as well. So when you do the kubectl get namespaces, it's behind the scenes, it's, well, the namespace is translated into Docker network. So behind the scenes, it's going to trigger go and well, Docker network list. And then that list will then be converted back to the Kubernetes object. And then it will be presented to the client. So that converter is the main one, the main component that does all the translations. Does that mean that the Kubernetes API that you're supporting are, it's kind of this, the surface area of Docker that makes sense. So there's Kubernetes resources that don't have any real translation into like a Docker kind of native right. resource. And so right. is that basically the API boundary or the APIs that K2D exposes is the subset of Kubernetes API that makes sense for a Docker engine essentially? Yes. Okay. Where there is a logical translations, like for example, the load balancer service. Yeah, mm -hmm. load balancer service, there's no natural translation to Docker, but there is because when you do with, with a Docker expose of an application externally, you can expose using load ports. So when you ask for a load balancer service, we simply allow you to, to deploy a container using the low ports um, on the host. Um, whereas if you do no port, we force you to do the high ports in a Docker network expose. So yeah, there, there are things where, where you can actually do yeah, brain matching and say, actually, this isn't a direct one-to-one -one comparison. There's no such thing as a load balancer on Docker, but what does a load balancer do? It looks like this. Same thing with the volumes. Yeah, we will go and create a Docker volume behind the scenes and yeah, PBC or PB in a PBC, same thing. It's we create a volume and we map it. Does that mean that you can use the same tooling like Helm or Customize or something like that, so long as you're only you've got Helm charts only for objects that are supported by the K2D API. Any tooling that uses kubectl or the Correct. Kubernetes API, that, that it just works then, right? Correct. Yeah. So we also support Helm as well. So as long as, yeah, it contains the supported resources, it's all good to go. I'm curious, were you able to utilize some of the existing Kubernetes libraries in building this so that it would redu reduce the amount of work you had to do? Yeah, that's pretty much what we did. So yeah, get the, the, well, it's all built with the native Kubernetes library and Docker yeah. library as well. We'll be using, mainly using SDKs. Okay. So yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that's so good because it could be a lot of work. This seems like it, it feels like a lot of work if you had to write all this from scratch. Yeah. And like Kubernetes, yep. like keeping up with the new versions of the Kubernetes API, like you're just kind of keeping up with it because you're uh, adopting the SDK. So yeah. I'm sure folks want to see you in action. You want to spin up something uh, with K2D? Yeah, so I'll do that now. It's all vaporware until it's the demo. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> it's, it's all in theory. Okay, so, yeah. Okay, so I'm just running a uh, Docker engine, version 26. That's really hot, the new one. <laughs> yeah, and, hot, hot, hot. <laughs> yeah. And this is a very small device, you see. Uh, well, it says 466, but it's half a gig of memory. So it's a very small device and yeah, K2D is perfectly fine for that. So what I'll do is, so this is the, this is our website, the installation guide. So if you want to give it a try, make sure you read it and you will see the hardware requirements. It's like really small. So yeah, a V7, and that means a 32 bit, right? That means a 32 bit kernel and yeah. Docker. Okay. Right. Well, yeah. Yeah. And. As we said, K2D runs on Docker Engine, and yeah, it's pretty much this. The only thing to be noted is the advertise address. So this this is going to be your main IP address that you, the K2D will be exposed to. So just that IP is the only important bit in here. And the secret is the, well, it becomes the token. So token to interact with K2D. So that's also, you can set your own. Or if you don't set it, it's going to be generated automatically. So this is up to you. Okay, so I have a small snippet here that I'll be running. Do that. Okay, so that was it. And when I print out the logs, yeah, so that's running fine. So now what I'll do 
is I will be getting the cube config file. So if I so this is interacting with the K to the endpoint that I specified. Okay. And when I trigger it, you'll see the typical Kubernetes cube config file, you see. So the API version plus the CA data and then the server and the token. So it's pretty much identical to the cube config file you know in the Kubernetes world. So now what it will do is I'm just going to put it to my local machine. Okay. So what I just did is I just have overwritten the cube config, the local file with the K2D one. So now what I can do is kubectl get namespaces. Whoa. And now I can see some namespaces there. So what just happened when you just did kubectl get namespaces is what you just mentioned earlier, right? So really this is just doing a Docker network ls command and mm. pulling out some of those networks as namespaces, Kubernetes namespaces, right? And in air quotes now, everything, all our Kubernetes resources are now air quoted. Air quotes. Uh, <laughs> very cool. If a namespace falls in the wood though, like it's still, <laughs> as long as we don't look under the Docker commands, we never know, right? <laughs> yeah. So namespace is pretty, pretty straightforward. <laughs> what about running a service, right? Running some service or pod or something like that? Well, the other thing, if you do a, a kubectl gets uh, get SC, you can actually, you can actually see the, the the storage classes as well. So you can actually you can go and see a whole bunch of resources. Ooh. So that's how you do your your persistent. Got it. So it yep. comes with some storage, some local storage configured already. Yeah. So this is the Docker volume local driver, pretty much. So yeah. Is it using labels in the background to associate Docker objects with yes, Kubernetes? We use, okay. Yeah, we Same use labels form, actually. Heavily. Yeah, and compose mm. actually. So yeah. And that's why we don't really get to use any key value store because we rely on uh, a lot of labels as well as we also create some config, config files locally. So yeah, that's how we can get a really small footprint. So there doesn't really need to be like a, like when we think of Kubernetes control plane, we think of like etcd or s some sort of storage there, database-ish thing. And, and it sounds like there's no need for that in this. Like you don't, do you need to write anything no. other than the secrets and the config maps and stuff like that? Is there something else that has to get written or is it all labels? So the only persistence we need is this k 2 d path right. here. So yeah. it, it stores the, the third secrets, config maps, and then the token. That's right. pretty much all we store. Okay. All the others will be label-based pretty much. Interesting. So does that mean that if you're, well, Let's get in. Uh, let's get back to the demo and get a service running, and then we can. I can ask some more detailed questions because you're percolating some really good questions in my mind. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Faster than you can write them down, probably. Yes, yeah. that's good. Yeah. So what I'll be deploying is a service called well, software oh. called NoThread, and yeah. this is really popular in the industrial IoT space. So this manifest contains a namespace, a deployment. And just a bunch of stuff. And you see, we are actually creating a PVC as well and mounting it. So a system volume claim and also service. I am creating it as a load balancer. So I will show you exactly how it translates load balancer to Docker world. What I'll do is the manifest is available in our website in the common IoT application examples. So you can Go and take a look at the list up here. Okay, so let's see if the, yeah. So you see the node red namespace has been created. And as I said before, that's the Docker network behind the scenes. So that's been done. And if I do cube, uh, cube CTL get pause, node red, woohoo, that's running. Nice. And I can also do logging as well. So you'll see the logs coming through. Nice. So just like Kubernetes, you can feel it, right? So yes. You can, and then the thing you will be interested in will be the service as well. So because there there's no concept of load balancer, just like Neil said, in the Docker world, but Docker allows you to use load ports. So what that means is we can actually set the external IP to the actual host's IP and then expose it through that. So that's how we emulate the load balancer. We also support node port as well. 
And we, what we actually do is we emulate high ports as well, which is higher than 30,000, which I'll do the demo later on. So if I now go to the browser and go 1880, you'll now see the node thread is running. So you see that I just deployed a pure Kubernetes manifest with the load balancer service type. And you can now see that I can interact with it. And the last thing I want to show you is the PVC. So you'll see the PVC object as well. And by the way, the capacity is shown as zero, and that's because there is no way we can grab that information from Docker. So that's mm. unfortunate, but yeah. And when I do PV, oops, oh, that's interesting. Well, while you're figuring that out, there's some resources that you deploy on Kubernetes that mm -hmm. might be permission to request API information from the Kubernetes API server, like metadata information, labels of things that are certain like controllers, is that concept supported with K2D or is that kind of out of scope of what you would what you intend to run on something like K2D? We actually play with host file entries and we actually create a host file entry in each pod that will resolve the kubernetes.default.service. So from within a pod that runs, you can actually resolve that one and you can actually, so a pod can actually run, have access to it as well. So got it. Yeah. I just want to make, I just want to recap real quick for everybody. Like if you're <laughs> yes. just joining us and you're like, what is so interesting about this Kubernetes command line that you're showing? This is not a, uh, this is actually not a node red demo, uh, but what we just did was we launched node red at uh, the web interface and everything with some storage on a tiny machine with a half a gig of memory. So it's running container D run C Docker D and then the, and then a translator or we don't have the right word or I'm not remembering the right word for this Kubernetes API emulator on top of it and as well as the app all on a half a gig of memory which yes like just let's just let's pause for a second and <laughs> yes. and say like we couldn't do that yesterday uh, or you know an hour ago at least I couldn't so yeah. this is pretty cool achievement by the expression on, on Mimmel's face there's a smile on his face he's like what has just happened here <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm, I really like this. I think anything to do with squeezing the most amount of performance out of the compute that's available is a goal, is, is something that's good because I think we end up like very, our default is with like these big servers where we kind of assume there's always resources around, but we forget that there's a lot of the IT world runs on small things that can't be updated that are uh, resource limited and also have been starved of the awesome tooling that's been created in the cloud native kind of environment that allows for easier deployment, those nice APIs that you get from Docker and, and, and Kubernetes. And I, I like seeing this kind of bringing that goodness to these resource constrained environments is always exciting to me. So that's where this big smile is coming from, Neil. But that being said, we did get a really good question from Andrew B in the chat. In the case that this, you know, we just mentioned that this is on less than half of a gig of memory. So in the case that CPU memory and disk space runs out or is exhausted, what happens? How does K2D deal with that? Well, there, remember, there is no K2D cluster. So, so right. basically, if you run out of memory, Docker OOM will kick in and will start doing okay. its out of memory reclaims and it will kill some things, whatever it needs to do. If it happens to kill the KGD container, we have a restart policy set to always anyway, so it should just restart. If Because it's stateless, it doesn't actually matter. As long as KGD restarts, then everything will continue. So there's no, it, yeah, every, the, all the state we need is held in metadata on the containers in Docker. And that's it. So you can actually, you can in fact delete K2D and, and redeploy it and you'll just continue off and you continue where, you, where, you, where you left off. So it's pretty straightforward. Yeah, that's really neat because then you could also just, like if you had like a one-time deployment, unless you need to change something, K2D doesn't even need to be there, right? Like, like you, just you need it. to kind of just, yeah, you could just stop it or it could just be deployed or you could have it only run every once in a while to receive command, you know, receive yeah. some kind of commands on the schedule yeah. and then remove itself so that you can even reduce the limited resources that it's taking at that time. So that's pretty neat. 
Yeah, and you can do a, a, a Docker run command on Docker, and then immediately alt-tab, kubectl get, and it will show you what you've just done in Docker as if it was done in Kubernetes. So the whole thing, it, yeah. it, it's a genuine two-way translator. So you can have people who know Docker interacting with the Docker host directly, people who know Kubernetes interfacing with the same host as if it's Kubernetes, and KGD in the middle does, does the translations. Oh, yeah, so <laughs> that, that's exactly what I was about to demo. So you oh, see that um, I can actually do the Docker run, and I'm running a thing called Mosquito. And then as soon as I do kubectl get ports, I'll see the Mosquito pod running. So it's actually bi-directional management. So if you're familiar with Kubernetes, go with kubectl. If you're more a Docker person, you can go with Docker. So it's quite flexible as well. That's awesome. And again, we, we, we built this for the industrial IoT markets and the people on the shop floor probably less likely to to be up to the play with Kubernetes, but they, they, they may be familiar with Docker. And so that is trying to help the IT OT convergence by allowing OT people to use Docker, IT people to use Kubernetes, and they're actually interfacing with the same thing in real time. Very cool. I didn't even think about that. I had a quick question. It's a little bit of a subject change, but we just had you on less than a month ago talking about Portainer. And we did talk a little bit about how Portainer can manage the edge and we showed off some of these like profiles and you could throw in thousands of nodes. I'm curious, like if, if you could compare and contrast those two models for like, I guess, doesn't the Portainer have to have an agent on the edge device in the case of Portainer? I, I, I'm just trying to figure out like, do these things fit together or they kind of end up being two different options for edge deployments? They, they can be used together or, or they can be used apart. So when you deploy K2D, there's a switch. You can just do, I think it's dash dash Portainer agent and we will automatically deploy the Portainer agent and register it with your Portainer instance. So you can just do that uh, automatically. However, if you don't want to, if you want to use Argo CD to manage all of your uh, K2D fleet, then you can do that too. Um, Stephen, was, if, if we have time, actually can can show us using Argo to control K2D um, because if, if we don't show you, people won't believe us. Um, but <laughs> it, it, it's very easy to manage to manage KGD either with Portainer or without, um, and they are there for you know, kind of different markets. So if you can use Docker on your small devices and you only want to use Docker, then use Docker. If you have to use Kubernetes tooling and you need to be able to use that tooling on devices at the edge, then that's where KGD comes in. Okay, interesting. I'd love to see a demo because that to me this was the one thing that I when I was talking to other engineers at KubeCon about. And th of course, we all just assume that it can't handle all whatever hundred plus resources in a Kubernetes cluster that are sort of part of the standard API set. And you telling me that Argo works on it, I would just reply to them and say, well, Argo works. <laughs> and they would say, oh, well, now I'm interested. Like the, 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 now you're talking like some significant tooling that, you know, Argo is not a simple little tool that only uses a couple of resources. It's kind of a big thing. So yeah, let's talk yeah. about it. Yeah, let's get into it. So this is a cluster that I added before. Well, in advance. So you'll see this IP is where K2D runs. And as you see, treats it as a Kubernetes cluster. It shows you the version and connections success. So it's all good to go. And how to add it is in the uh, advanced configuration doc. So you can go and take a look at our Argo documentation down there. Okay, so I'm just going to get deploy a app quickly. So I'm just going to say, uh, I'm going to be deploying node rate again. And I'll set the sync policy to automatic. Um, the other ones I'll just set to default. So in here, I have a small... Oh, by the way, the manifest I'll be deploying is this guy. Uh, this time, it's just going into the default namespace. Uh, but the difference is, is that I am actually using the host pass. So you, you don't actually... Well, it supports host pass as well. So if you want to right. buy mount, then that that's also supported. And this time the service will be created as a node port. So you'll see how we emulate the high ports as well. Yep. So let's uh, see the node grid. That's pretty much it. Oh, I need to select the cluster and namespace. I'm just going to put it to the default one. Cool. Now I create. Cool. So the sync is okay. Oh, I'll just, and when I do the refresh, 
That's yay. all set. So, yay. <laughs> so now all the deployment and service is now all deployed and synced. So from this point of time, you will be able to do the traditional GitOps stuff, which is quite cool. Yeah. And coming back here, it's going to do Docker PS and you'll see the node thread running. Yeah. So, and you see the high ports exposed as well, which is 30783. So if I now go to this guy and specify the high port, it will interact. Interesting. There you go. So just to recap, you have Argo CD configured to pointing to your GitOps repo on GitHub with a manifest mm -hmm. or a configuration for this application that has a volume, a host bind mount volume and mm -hmm. a node port. And then you had Argo CD synchronize it to K2D. And Ar from yes. Argo's point of view, it just looks like a normal Kubernetes cluster, right? Like you didn't configure Argo in exactly. any kind of like weird way. Nope, to, not. Yeah. And then it just deployed that application and configured it. Awesome. Yep. And presumably, Pretty like, much. yeah. And I mean, I'm assuming in this scenario, right? Because we have these tiny little devices, we wouldn't be running Argo on the devices. I'm guessing it would be running central on a more capable yeah, piece of hardware. Because I'm guessing that Argo uses a lot more resources than K2D does. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. That's it's even if you, if you go back and do, just do a, a kubectl get nodes, you can actually see that it's just a single node cluster. Yeah. It, it, oh, yeah, it yeah. Emulates. Yeah. So, yep. Just one. And it, I saw that it was emulating 1.28. So the APIs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's kind of your yeah. internal approach to you at least tested. You know, you tested on 128. So at least. The standard resources you support at least com are compatible with 128. That's pretty slick. And I honestly think like to those, like there's a lot of scenarios where the it just doesn't matter and no one would know that this really isn't a full Kubernetes control plan underneath. And we had a real quick talk before the show about, you know, that this technically, this scenario isn't, what's, what's the word, the sort of Kubernetes API compliance tests or whatever. That it probably wouldn't pass those, I'm guessing. Uh, there's absolutely no way to pass them. <laughs> okay. this, no way. You know, you've surprised me before, so I'm thinking like, yeah, you're probably like, yeah, it flies. It, it totally f works with flying colors. I mean, if, if we were able to constrain them, yes. But you know, we tried to be as as honest as we could in the the, the docs and on the KG website. We've listed everything that works, and there's also a limitations page. We've listed everything that doesn't work, and what mm -hmm. we plan to add in the future, and what we don't. Things like like RBAC, you know, RBAC doesn't, we don't really need that at the far edge. Daemon sets, because it's a single node cluster, we don't need that, but we already can do persistence. So we've got a list of the things that we've got there. Yeah, we do already support configs and secrets. As you can see, the secrets are not, not encoded. So as as we go through, yeah, you can see there's a, there's a bunch of things that we do and things we don't do. And while we've not done it, a lot of them are by design. Um, there's no need for it right. for this use case, but... As the use cases begin to vary, we can we can emulate kind of anything that we need to emulate that makes sense. Yeah. Conrad, you've already got a request. Conrad's asking, what's the roadmap for supporting host networking on Docker Desktop for Mac? <laughs> it's also uh, um, Docker Desktop for Windows as well. It's actually just the host network because it's actually a host emulated on a host. So it doesn't like the, 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 the double host. Um, if I'm not mistaken, you can actually use the bridge network. You can you can change change the KDD deployment to use bridge network, and then it works fine. If I'm not mistaken, all right. Oh, I see what you're saying. The and that would obviously like, I mean, we have full Kubernetes in Docker Desktop, so I guess it's really for Conrad to because he's already the one implementing this right now while we're talking. Yeah, about this. he's literally running the getting started right now and going through. <laughs> um, <laughs> proper engineer. Steven, what else? Anything else in there? You, we only have a few minutes left, but I didn't know if we had finished all your demos or... No, that was pretty much it. I'm pretty happy that I was able to do all the demos I prepared. It works. So <laughs> it did yeah, work. It worked. Yeah. Uh, we do have some K9S <laughs> fans, K9's fans on the show. So I, I'm just trying to think of like what possibly thing we could prove. And if you, I don't know if you have K9S installed, but yeah. just proving that it would run and uh, list things is maybe... I mean, we I think we've kind of proven that at this point. I'm just trying to think of... Uh, other cool things to show off I, because we have we have some yeah plans. so I feel I feel like any any tool that's using like yeah. the Kubernetes API should work like Open Lens should work K9 should definitely work I can't imagine it wouldn't mm -hmm. I think there's also tools that you can 
probably have views into multi multiple clusters. And I think that would be a real any UX or any tool that does a multi-cluster view or a multi-cluster yeah. aggregation of, of the aggregated view would probably be really awesome because each of these K2D nodes is an individual cluster, essentially, right? And so there's no concept of a cross K2D aggregated cluster, correct? Like multiple K2D nodes acting as multiple nodes to a single cluster? That's no. okay. This is this is different from the likes of of, of Kubeage. You know, Kubeage is a CNCF project where you, you emulate one giant virtual cluster, and then all of the edge nodes become workers. This is a different approach. This says, well, you're actually going to have some kind of central cluster manager, and all of your nodes are discrete clusters. So, you know, they're both trying to achieve the same thing: really low footprint on the device. One says, move the control plane into the cloud. We say, make the control plane as small as possible. Cool. Are you exposing metrics or observe? You know. How do you get some of the details on CPU memory, yeah. disk well, utilization, yeah. what's going on there? That's on the roadmap. So that's actually the, yeah, yeah. So that's actually the feature I was working on. So it's on the roadmap. Awesome. Uh, so speaking of roadmap, we have a few minutes left. We plan to port the equivalent of Docker stats across. So when you do the metrics, API, the metrics APIs, you'll get the Docker stat, the equivalent of Docker stats. Awesome. Oh. And so speaking of roadmap, what's on the roadmap? What's next, Stephen? Well, metrics is fun. And we were thinking of supporting ContainerD as well. It's in the future mm-hmm. roadmap, but ContainerD will be much more lightweight. So it's something we were considering. And if you go to our K2D website, well, GitHub, and when you look at the issues, you will see some of the uh, future requests that's coming through. So like, IPv6 support, uh, job simulation, ingress service. So those are the future support that, well, that's what, what's on the roadmap. I was going to ask this question because this is a great little conversation that we don't have time for. But, you know, like if the goal is to help people that are familiar with Docker, obviously removing Docker from the equation is kind of weird. Right. But also it does remove a layer of a daemon always running in the background. And could mm-hmm. we get even lighter weight with container D and then maybe like CTR built in or something so that you can at least do some of the low level stuff that you don't have to build in to every single command of the key control. That, that would be an interesting side project and then show sort of like the full K3S, lots of memory, lots of CPU, disk IO, and then like K2D with Docker is like in the middle and then like K2D or K2C, K2CD, like the absolute minimum possible, We you know, we can't possibly get any thinner, yeah. any leaner <laughs> approach. And who knows? I mean, this is the kind of thing, idea where like, and you know, someone builds a single binary that has container D and K2D and everything all built in. And then now we're off to the races and, you know, so who knows what possible, what's possible. Well, it, okay. So people can get started on the, on the website. I've been sending all the links out about the, on the GitHub, they have the website, they have the docs, they have the getting started guide. I mean, this is like, this is not day one. This is close to day one for them on this project, but they've already got docs, already helping you get started, already have people filing issues. So if you think this is, if you, if you work in industry or if simply you, you need a new life for your old Raspberry Pi OG or like Raspberry Pi 3 or something that was like a V7, I think I had one of the V6 or V7 CPUs still lying around in my closet somewhere. If you want to check that stuff out, this is the project for you. Steven, is there like, other than the GitHub, is there, do you have a Discord or a Slack or anything for people to jump in? Or how do they reach out to you and the team if they have issues other than Git, if, other than GitHub? I guess GitHub's obviously an no. option. Get, okay. GitHub and, and we've got uh, GitHub discussions. Oh yeah, great. Awesome. Always forget about those. Or just email me. Yeah, yeah. And f- find your email on GitHub probably and send you an email or LinkedIn or where, wherever you can find all of us. We keep talking about how we're all on LinkedIn, even though we don't necessarily want to be. Well, thank you both for being here. This is a fantastic episode. I was actually really excited to dig in and it did not disappoint. I'm sure that Nermal and I will be talking to other people in the, the container D ecosystem when we see them, if not at the next KubeCon, about this little tiny, even tinier approach to scenarios. And honestly, in the Kubernetes community, I think there's a lot of room for options around maybe we don't need the full Kubernetes. Maybe we need just half, like half Kubernetes or something. And you know, a lot of people go to Swarm for that. We have people on the chat that we're saying, oh, we've already mentioned Swarm, you know, five minutes in. Pro Cheeseburger, I see you. So that's going to be something that we maybe were put into the issues. I can see one of the people from our community yes. requesting that. 
and being able to have even you know the ability to deploy onto a swarm from a tiny little thing that's still actually running Kubernetes. Anyway, what a world we live in, all this cool tech. Well, thank you both for being here. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.